Number 10, Jennifer Aniston nearly quit. Jennifer was the last to sign for the final 10th season of Friends, and she very nearly didn't return at all. Part of this was down to her busy career because at this point, she was definitely one of the most famous of the Friends cast. She had several movies on the slate. She later revealed that she was debating not coming back because she had a couple of issues that she was dealing with at the time. Jennifer said that she wanted to end the show when people still loved them and they were on a high. She also questioned herself about how long she really wanted to play Rachel. Jennifer obviously eventually agreed to the final season, but she is the reason why it's the shortest season, because she only agreed to return if it was cut short. Luckily for everyone, she decided to stay and felt bittersweet about the final season, and in the end she found herself wishing that it could have continued on. Most of the cast members' careers have crashed and burned after Friends ended, but Jennifer Aniston was a rare exception. She went on to star in several Hollywood blockbusters like Bruce Almighty, Breakup, Marley and Me, Just Go With It, Horrible Bosses, and Where the Millers, all of which were very successful at the box office. Number 9, Matthew struggled with substances. As we know, Matthew Perry's sudden death has completely shocked the world. The beloved actor was found at his home after an apparent drowning. He was only 54 years old, and his passing was an absolute tragedy. Many of the Friends cast struggled to deal with their newfound fame, and for Matthew, this led to problems with addiction, which he has been extremely open about in his memoir. Although he said that he was never drunk on set, he did admit to being painfully hungover to the point that everyone became aware of. After more than one stint in rehab, he managed to get clean, and then he became very passionate about helping other people who were struggling. Just last year, he revealed that he and Jennifer Aniston had stayed in each other's lives, and they remained in close contact. He said that it was actually Jennifer who confronted him first about his addictions during the filming of the show. Apparently, she approached him during a break and told him, we know you're drinking. And looking back on that moment, Matthew thought that it was very scary, because in his own mind, he thought he was doing a perfectly fine job of hiding his habits from his co-stars. At a certain point, they all knew that he was in trouble, and they did their best to support him. Number 8, Lisa Kudrow sued the show. Lisa Kudrow's manager Scott Howard sued her in 2008, year after she ended her contract with him, and four years after Friends ended. Howard claimed that Lisa owed him residuals for the reruns of Friends and other projects that she had worked on while under his management, to the tune of 10% of everything that she got. He stopped paying him when the contract was dissolved and argued that the 10% was only payable when he was managing her. Eventually, he won the case in 2014, and the judge awarded him $1. $1.6 million. Of course, for someone who earned $1 million per episode for the final seasons of Friends, that figure wouldn't have put too much of a dent in her bank account. In a statement, Elisa's attorney said, the jury's verdict is merely one step in the legal process. This case will ultimately be resolved at the appellate level. Mrs. Kudrow has faith in the judicial system, and she believes that the eventual outcome of this contractual dispute will be in her favor. In a statement of his own, Scott Howard's attorney said, what generally happens now with unsophisticated actors actress clients is they overpay for filing a frivolous appeal that has no chance for success. So this legal battle got extremely messy in the end and it must have been embarrassing to be a part of. Number 7, David Schwimmer went into hiding. As we know, David struggled with the fame that came from being such a huge hit at such a young age. Of the main six actors and friends, he's the one who has shied away from the limelight the most. Although he continued to work after the show ended, he spent many years preferring to do voice work, directing, producing, and has been canned about struggling to find a way to continue acting as he's such a huge celebrity. He said, it was pretty jarring and I messed with my relationships with other people in a way that took years. I need to kind of adjust to and become comfortable. It made me want to hide under a baseball cap and not be seen. So I was trying to figure out how do I be an actor in this new world, in this new situation. Friends was such a huge hit from the moment it premiered that it didn't just bring fame to its stars, it brought a mega level of fame that is hard to understand. For David, it was just too hard to deal with. So much so that it didn't just affect him, but his relationships and other people as well. He was also an actor who, as a part of his craft, liked to be anonymous and observe people out in the world. But of course, he simply could not do that anymore once he reached that certain level of success. Number 6, Matt LeBlanc was arrested. Before he became famous, Matt was already getting used to that crazy party lifestyle that most people associate with being a celebrity. After Friends was finished, he admitted that he was arrested for drunk driving twice. He said,
said, when I was young and stupid, I wasn't driving fast, just crooked. This came up when he was cast as one of the hosts of the new Top Gear, and fans were not sure whether a history of reckless driving was a good thing when it came to presenting a show about cars. Matt dismissed the incidents as the product of his age, although he has said that he's grateful the press never got a hold of his mugshots. While his drunk driving record happened before fame and fortune came to him, he also got into some pretty dark times when it came to dealing with his newfound fame. He nearly had a nervous breakdown due to the intensity of working on Friends, especially when the show came to an end. Speaking about that time, Matt said that for years and years, he barely left the house because he was so burnt out. He wanted not to have a schedule and not to have to be anywhere. Luckily, he was in a position financially to be able to do that with all of his savings, but of course his agent was not too happy. Matt said that was a very dark time for him and it even led to a nervous breakdown. Number five, Jennifer Aniston's wedding. While not every cast is close off screen, the cast of Friends was known for being friends in real life, as well as having a huddle before each episode started filming and negotiating their salaries as a team. The cast were often photographed out and about together and they talked in interviews about how close they remained, even after the filming ended. I mean, Jennifer Aniston is even godmother to Courtney Cox's daughter. But in 2015, when she married Justin Theroux, she didn't invite any of her male co-stars to the ceremony. It was a small wedding with only 70 guests, but it did include Courtney and Lisa. Matthew Perry said that he was surprised he wasn't invited, but he was still very happy for the couple, despite the awkwardness of rejection. Hopefully though, he didn't take too much offense, considering that Jennifer didn't even invite her own mother to her wedding with Brad Pitt in 2000. In an interview with Ellen in 2018, she opened up about why she went years without talking to her mother, Nancy Dow, saying, quote, she was critical, she was very critical of me. Because she was a model, she was beautiful, magnificent, I wasn't, I never was. She added that her mother was very unforgiving and would often hold long grudges. They ended up reuniting several years later, and by Jen's marriage to her second husband, Justin, in 2015, they were finally on speaking terms. But the funny thing is, Nancy still wasn't invited to that wedding either. Number four, David's neighbors hated him. Even stars have feuds with their neighbors and David Schwimmer is no exception. In 2010, the star bought a property in the East Village, townhouse from 1852, and of course the land that it stood on. But he decided that rather than renovate it to keep up the facade, he would just tear the whole thing down and start fresh. It's something that a lot of property developers are known for doing, but it's never really a popular decision. As a result, an anonymous neighbor left a message for him that was too big to ignore. For some reason, they decided it would really upset him if they spray painted in huge letters on the construction site fence. They wrote the words, Ross is not cool, which is both hilarious and kind of genius because it actually echoed a storyline from the show, where Ross moves into a new building and becomes enemies with the neighbors by not chipping in for the maintenance man's retirement gift, which kind of goes to show you that life really does imitate art. There's no saying how David reacted to this, but you can imagine that he wouldn't be too pleased that the construction site had graffiti. Matthew's extreme anxiety. Matthew Perry admitted two years ago that he suffered from anxiety, which often came when he was trying to be as funny as he could in front of the live studio audience while they were filming Friends. The admission came up during the HBO Max Friends reunion with Jennifer Aniston, Courtney Cox, Lisa Kudrow, Matt LeBlanc, and David Schwimmer. Matthew said that trying to be great made him extremely nervous, and his co-stars at the reunion said they never had any idea that he was suffering on set because he always delivered such a fabulous performance while being seemingly at ease. He said to me, I felt like I was going to die if they didn't laugh. And it's not healthy for sure, but I would sometimes say a line and they wouldn't laugh and I would sweat and just go into convulsions if I didn't get the laugh I was supposed to get. I would freak out. His co-star Lisa was shocked to hear that. She said that Matthew was always such a cool cucumber and he was one of the best on set, always delivering a line well as he played Chandler. Even though he never said anything to his co-stars back then, he felt this way every single night. And as we know now, his time on Friends was significantly impacted by his addiction. Memoir controversy. One surprise takeaway from Matthew Perry's autobiography was his apparent feelings towards Keanu Reeves, after he repeatedly questioned why other actors die while Keanu is still alive. Quote, why is it that original thinkers like River Phoenix and Heath Ledger die, but Keanu Reeves still walks among us? Upon learning that another former co-star Chris Farley had died, he wrote, I punched a hole through Jennifer Aniston's dressing room wall when I found out. And in the next line, he wrote, Keanu Reeves still walks among us. 
Matthew would later apologize for the comments and then release a statement saying, I'm actually a big fan of Keanu. I just chose a random name, my mistake. I apologize. But that wasn't it at all. There was also a lot of other interesting admissions in his memoir. Another thing he also revealed is that he asked out Jennifer Aniston before filming Friends. He said that the two of them were the only friend stars who knew each other before the show, having met three years before through mutual acquaintances. In one part of the book he wrote, I was immediately taken by her, how could I not be, and liked her. I got the sense that she was intrigued too and maybe it was going to be something. Safe to say that fans were more than shocked by that revelation. And number one, everyone was scared of Matt LeBlanc. Now Joey is far from a scary guy, but when Matt LeBlanc was first cast in the role, some of the other cast members were a little bit afraid of him. This fear was based off of what they knew about Matt himself. The fact that he was raised by a mechanic and had done a stint as a male model as well, and had done a stint and had done a stint as a male model, as well as what they knew about the character of Joey, who was known as a very forward womanizer. Jennifer Aniston in particular remembers being intimidated before she met him herself. She said, I was scared of that type of guy. He thinks it's very funny now, and actually he can sit down and comfort me just like Courtney or Lisa could. So it's a good thing that Matt turned out to be just as much of a sweetheart as Joey was, despite a slightly rocky start. Number 10, Secret Son. While many know of the existence of Jaden and Willow Smith, did you know that Will Smith has a third son? Trey Smith was the product of Will's previous marriage to Cherie Zampino and tends to fly under the radar in the eyes of the media. In 2018, Jada brought Zampino onto her show and spilled the tea on the real story behind Trey, their relationship to each other, and Will's role as his biological father. For many Smith fans, this was the first time that we'd actually ever heard about Trey. Will claims that he had to distance himself from Trey and his mother following the divorce. Will recounts struggling to maintain a healthy enough relationship with Zampino for him to play the role of Trey's father. Trey was raised by his mom alone, growing up feeling betrayed and abandoned by Will. Eventually, Will made amends and became a proper part of Trey's life, but for a long time, Trey was kept hidden from the public, surely leaving a stain on the family unit that will never be washed away. Number 9. Seven Year Separation Cheating rumors and dating scandals have followed this couple through their entire relationship. Since day one, people were convinced that they were in an open relationship, or maybe they were cheating on each other on and off basically the entire time. Well, it turns out that those rumors were kind of true. Ahead of the release of her new book, Worthy, Jade sat down with People Magazine to share some inside info. The most revealing was that herself and Will Smith had actually been separated for seven years. Despite appearing to be a happy couple on the outside, the truth was they decided to go their separate ways, emotionally speaking, a long time ago. Since 2016, Jada and Will have been living in the same house and appearing on red carpets together, but behind the scenes they actually just don't do anything together. Considering the massive size of Will's house, it's easy to imagine Jada choosing her own little section and just decorating it to her Liking. She continued to say that she felt pressured into being with Will because it was mainly his idea to get together in the first place, two kids and one marriage later, and it would appear that Jada finally came to her senses and decided to split. Number 8. Will's Orientation In 2012, Star Magazine published an expose on Will that somehow stuck around for years. The outlet alleged that Will and his wife were headed for divorce because of his growing bromance with fellow actor Dwayne Martin, which was speculated upon due to the multiple outings that the pair shared in a short span of time, because you know, people can't be buddies anymore. The rumor was only intensified when Jada expressed her dislike for their friendship, saying that she felt like Will flaunted it in her face. He takes Dwayne out all day and on exotic vacations, and while she just sits at home alone in her university-sized house. While it's never actually been confirmed, the fact that multiple sources accused Will of basically the same thing makes people believe that there may be some merit to the rumors, but eh, who knows and who cares? Number 7. Will Smith almost ended his father's life The Smiths are famous for getting into way too much detail when discussing their family history. Will Smith released a memoir called Will in 2021 that was chock full of juicy information that most certainly should have remained secret. One of the most shocking revelations in the book would have resulted in Will spending his life in prison had he followed through with his plans. The actor explained his father, Will Smith Sr., got physical towards himself and his mother constantly. As a young one, he vowed to seek revenge for his mother when he was older and capable of more. Eventually, his father was diagnosed with cancer and Will was forced to take care of him while he was bedridden. Will saw this as the perfect opportunity to take Papa down. He wrote one night, As I delicately wheeled him from his bedroom towards the bathroom, a darkness arose within me. Ugh. 
He then went on to describe the moment that he contemplated pushing this man down the stairs and noted that no one would have suspected him and the moment would have been perfect. He wrote, I am one of the best actors in the world. My 911 call could have been Academy Award level. Will ultimately decided not to end his father's life, obviously, instead taking care of him until he passed away in 2016. Number six, interview evidence. When Jada revealed the truth about her separation from Will, she claimed that by the time they reached 2016 that they had just become exhausted with trying to make things work. The news of their separation was like a mild shock to most people as super sleuth fans claimed to have proof that Will and Jada were separated a long time ago. And the proof is in the interviews. The first clip to be submitted as evidence was Will and Jada's Red Table Talk interaction in which she admitted to the entanglement with musician Ox Dalzina and simultaneously admitted to a brief separation between herself and Will. In the conversation, she literally says that herself and Will had basically broken up, but instead of just outright admitting the information right then and there, she decided to hold on to it for a better time. Many Jada fans have commented on the resurfaced clips, saying that Will looks drained, clearly dealing with a ton mentally. Jada is a calculated woman. Why reveal all the juicy gossip that she's got so early in her life when she could probably just wait and yeah, it'll help sell some books? She was probably ready to tell the world what happened as soon as it happened, but held onto the information as a way to give her a boost in the future if it was needed. Is it really a surprise that she's releasing all this information right when her book's coming out? Huh? 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 Give them a scoop so they have to buy more and get the good stuff. Good move, but very manipulative, lady. Number five gets busy to relax. While the Smiths have famously entangled with other celebrities throughout their marriage, Will once again shared just a bit too much information in his book Will, and at one point he made a not so shocking confession. When he was younger, Will was dating a woman named Melanie, who he discovered was cheating on him while he was away from work. Smith was deeply attached to his former girlfriend and to just women in general. In his book, Will writes that he always needed a woman to achieve for. Prior to Melanie, Will had only been with one other woman woman physically. But following the breakup, Will claims to have gone hyena mode over the next few months, making love to anyone who would consent. At first, using this as a way to relax and feel better about the relationship, it eventually grew into a full-fledged addiction to the point where Will claims to have suffered a psychosomatic reaction from the escapades causing him to occasionally vomit the moment he reaches completion. Again, I didn't need that image in my head, I didn't need to know that, but since I have to suffer, now you have to as well. Number four, that's what she said. As we all know by now, Will Smith doesn't like Chris Rock putting his wife's name in his mouth, okay? After the altercation that took place in 2022 with the Oscars, a ton of people were convinced that it was Jada who told Will to do it. Will was laughing moments before taking the stage and doing his thing. According to Jada, she actually had zero part in the altercation and thought that the entire thing was a skit right up until she saw Will walking back towards her. The fury in this man's eyes could not be faked. She revealed that she actually didn't mind the G.I. Jane joke all that much. I mean, sure, she didn't appreciate it, but according to her, she in no way told Will Smith to strike her Madagascar co-star. The first thing that she had actually apparently said to him when he sat down was just, are you okay? He went up to accept his award for best actor and later apologized for his actions. Despite the apology, he was banned from attending the Oscars for 10 years, and so far, he has not spoken to Chris Rock face to face. Number three, Weird science. Now, while I can't say what this belief system is actually called, it's usually spoken in reference to Hollywood madman Tom Cruise and involves L. Ron Hubbard, so that should be enough for you to piece it together. Jada Pinkett Smith was briefly involved in the community and still partakes in some of its methods to this day. Jada and the rest of her family have often been linked to the controversial religion, though no members apart from Jada have ever actually admitted to being involved in any way, shape, or form. While Jada denies that she is a full-fledged member, the facts are she's been spotted attending several church events over the years. Former member Leah Romini backed up the claims of Jada's involvement, telling the Daily Beast that she herself interacted with Jada at an event taking place at the Science Celebrity Center. Essentially a giant room with famous nutcases, and Tom Cruise probably has an apartment in there. If you want proof that the Smiths are involved in the religion, the family literally founded a school that contained an exclusively science-based curriculum. That'd be like me opening a library containing containing just the Twilight books and being like, man, what are you talking about? I freaking hate Twilight. Why does everybody think I like Twilight so much? 
Number two, they actually suck. While rumors plagued Will and Jada from the moment that they were married, their careers never seemed to suffer at all. In fact, some would argue that Will was slowly taking over the Hollywood world, starring in movies like the Men in Black franchise, I Am Legend, and Bad Boys. It wasn't until he struck Chris Rock at the Oscar ceremony live in front of the world that the truth began to be revealed. Will exposed himself as an impulsive and aggressive man, hidden behind a big smile. When Chris insulted Jada Pinkett Smith by joking about his excitement for G.I.J. in the movie, Will initially laughed, but of course he went on stage and we all know that he didn't find it funny. Will won Best Actor that night, but it would be the last good thing that ever happened to this man. The Academy banned him from attending any events in the next 10 years, he's been blacklisted in Hollywood, and Jada's talk show on Facebook was cancelled. So it turns out the most sane people in the Smith family are Will's kids, and I'm not sure how to feel about that. Number one, Oscar's confusion. Now that all this information is being leaked into the world by Jada herself, one major question was still lingering on everyone's minds. If she hasn't been with Will for seven years, why did he feel like it was necessary to defend her and strike Chris Rock at the Oscars? Many fans have flooded social media with questions and concerns surrounding the incident. Now, if you don't remember, how? Chris Rock made fun of Jada for being bald, Will Smith went on stage and took him out for it, the end. Now, if Will Smith had been attending Chris Rock's stand-up special that came out earlier this year, who knows what would have happened? It was. Fantastic, you should really check it out. Despite Will claiming that playing the role of King Richard had left him in an odd mental state, it really was no excuse for his outburst, especially if he had not been romantically involved with Jada in years. The main point being made by some is that despite Will and Jada not being together romantically, that they remained close friends, and in that instance, Will was defending his very good friend, right? But that's still no excuse for causing Marty the Zebra pain. Man, I love Madagascar. You check it out. Number 10, Justin Timberlake. One of the most discussed sections of the memoir is of course the revelation of what really happened when Britney and her Mickey Mouse Club co-star Justin Timberlake got together. After meeting JT in the clubhouse, the two sparked a romantic connection. Their connection was strong, but unfortunately Britney had to make a difficult decision in the year 2000 after she found out she was pregnant. At first, Britney was actually pretty excited about the whole thing. In her book, she revealed that she had planned on starting a family with Justin at some point, but this was just going to be a little bit earlier than she expected. It turns out Justin was not so excited and told her that they were both too young to be starting a family, continuing to remind her that their careers would also need to be put on pause. This revelation may be part of the reason that Justin was reportedly so nervous leading up to the book's release. Brittany revealed that if the decision had solely been left to her, she would have gone through with the pregnancy, but she decided to go the opposite route instead. She claims to have only done it because Justin just so clearly did not want to be the father. In the book, she said that look back, it's one of the most agonizing things she had ever experienced in her life. Number 9, Mama Spears. One thing that comes up a lot in Britney Spears' memoir is her relationship to her parents. She discusses the strain that has been placed especially on the bond between herself and her mother Lynn Spears. She dives deep into her childhood and what really went down, and in the book she said that she started drinking no-no juice with her mother when she was just in the 8th grade. Of course that is awful and nobody should ever do that because Britney would wouldn't just have a sip of grape juice now and again. No, she would drink no-no juice like it was her job. She explained that for fun, she started having fruity no-no juice with her mom while they were in Biloxi, Mississippi. To make things feel less, you know, illegal, they would call the drinks toddies, named after the adult beverage that's basically just no-no tea. Brittany felt a special bond with her mother because of this, especially considering the contrast between her mom and her father, Jamie. You see, when her mom had a few, she was bubbly and happy, and same with Britney, but when Jamie had a few, he would get angry and depressed. The behavior is terrible, and while bonding with your parents is pretty awesome, that is not the right way to do it. Number 8, The Snake. Britney Spears has performed at the Video Music Awards a few times over her career, but none quite as memorable as her infamous dance with The Snake at the 2001 VMA ceremony. Britney walked on stage and began a performance of I'm a Slave for You with a massive snake draped across her shoulders. At first it seemed cool, but throughout the performance, she doesn't look at it once, keeping her head down or aimed directly at the audience. In the memoir, she revealed that she is not only terrified of snakes, but that this one actually started hissing in her ears while she was on stage. 
<laughs> Partway through the performance, the snake wraps around her and puts its face right near her ear where she claims it hissed so loudly lit for a moment she thought it was going to bite her face off. But she continued with the performance and thankfully she still has her face. So that, that's very good. Number seven, The Notebook. While Britney may be known for her musical talents, she did have a short career in the film industry in the early 2000s. Her first role was in the film Crossroads, which despite having a stellar cast, was apparently a very difficult experience for Britney. Although she was thrown off by that film, she was actually offered the co-starring lead role in The Notebook. The process went so deep that before production was set to begin, it was down to her and Rachel McAdams for the part. Now we all know what happened when Rachel McAdams got the role. She had a terrible terrible time on set and spent two years with Ryan Gosling off screen. Yay! Britney said it would have been fun to reconnect with her Mickey Mouse Club co-star Ryan Gosling for a full length feature, but in the end she's pretty glad that they didn't pick her. She instead decided to work on her album In The Zone, putting her creative efforts to good use despite this Hollywood rejection. Now while the film has gone down in history as a rom-com classic, nobody can even fathom what a Britney and Ryan led movie might have looked like, but it probably would have looked something like this. Number Number six, Mickey Mouse Club. Now I actually didn't know this because to be honest, I'm not a big Britney Spears fan. Oh, I know it's a shocker, I just scream pop music. But the first time I saw this woman on screen was genuinely in Austin Powers Gold Member and her head exploded. So overall, pretty solid first impression. However, her actual first role in the acting world took place in 1993 after she landed a gig on the Mickey Mouse Club, a show that would turn out to be a huge part of her life. Despite the colorful set and overall just Disney-ness of the show, Britney explained that filming was never easy. She revealed that the show was like being at a boot camp for the entertainment industry. Sense of dance rehearsals, singing lessons, acting classes, time in the recording studio, school in between, it was a lot. In fact, much like school, she explained that the show's cast was divided into cliques, with the younger castmates being in one crew and the olders being in the other. She admitted that there were some fun moments, like sharing a little smooch with Justin Timberlake, but it was still a very grueling job. She said it was extremely hard to work and more often than not the groups would be in rehearsal practicing choreography 30 times a day. That's like 28 times too many. At the end of the day, Britney treated the club like a job that took up a ton of her childhood. Number 5, Jamie Spears. Britney's father, Jamie, has had a complex relationship with his daughter for most of her life. In her memoir, she shared the harsh judgment she constantly received from her papa. She explained that she thought getting criticized for her body in the press was bad, but it hurt even more when it was coming from her own father. He repeatedly told her that she looked heavy and that she really needed to do something about it. Uh, it wasn't that nice, but I'm paraphrasing. She explained that even as a small child, he never gave her the love or the attention that she needed. In the book, she said that feeling like you are never good enough is a soul-crushing state for a young child. He drummed that message into her growing up, and even after she accomplished so much, he was continuing to make her feel like dirt. Jamie's wild opinions about Britney got so much worse when she was under her conservatorship. Under the conservatorship, Jamie was named as one of the several people in her life that could make important decisions for her. Mind, body, and soul. And she was forced to grow her recently shaved hair back and get back into shape. For 13 years, Jamie remained in control of her life right up until the suspension in 2021. Speaking of which, number four, conservatorship. As many may know, Britney was placed under a psychiatric hold in 2008 following what we will call a difficult evening and was later placed under a conservatorship by her father Jamie. In her book, she explained what she had been going through at the time. She said that shaving her head and acting out were her ways of pushing back. Under the conservatorship, she was made to understand that those days were now over. She had to grow her hair back, get back into shape, and she went to bed early and had to take whatever medications that they told her to. Brittany revealed that she felt like an infant under the conservatorship and lost her passion for music. She explained that she started to feel more and more like a thing on stage rather rather than a person. In her book, she said she had always felt music in her bones, but her family kind of stole that from her. She reminded readers of the contrast between male and female artists, telling them to think of all the male artists who've gambled their money away, who had substance control issues or mental health issues, and many of them have never had control of their bodies or money taken away. Before the book was released, people were just under the impression that the conservatorship was some kind of a financial thing, but as her book has revealed, it's a lot darker than that. Number three, The Secret Man. Among the many things being revealed in Britney's memoir, one shocking revelation was that she actually met and fell in love with a man while under her conservatorship that almost led her to fleeing the US with said man. She explained that she was 
talking to a guy that she really liked and he wanted her to leave the country with him. Not creepy at all. They had a secret relationship for quite some time and were eventually set to make the journey across the sea. But when she opened up about the romance to her assistant, she was hesitant, saying that she was worried what her father may do. Her assistant guaranteed nothing would happen, but was proven wrong when she was forced into a mental health facility around the same time that she was supposed to leave the country. Now, there's never been a confirmation if the two situations are related, but it kind of feels like it is. Yeah, it feels like they were. Number two, finding her voice. Brittany has been through a ton in her life, but it turns out that we didn't even know the half of it. During her court testimonies while she was attempting to reclaim her freedom, she said that she was forced to go to a mental health facility against her will in early 2019. It was almost two years ago that she regained control of her millions and every other aspect of her life. In 2022, her father requested to unseal all of the records from the duration of her conservatorship. Brittany's attorney, Matthew Rosengart, called this move offensive and highly inappropriate. He explained that they did not believe a father who loves his daughter would file to unseal her medical records. Makes sense. Brittany's new book is a new revelation to her side of things. A little over a year ago, her younger sister, Jamie Lynn, released a book called Things I Should Have Said, and in it she included a ton of details regarding Brittany that seemed to paint her in a bad light. But most of Brittany's fans felt that the stories were just a way to profit off her older sister during a time when she was still making headlines. And at number one, lost all control. As previously mentioned, when Brittany was placed under her conservatorship, every single aspect of her life was controlled by someone else and mostly her dad. She was unable to make financial, physical, or personal decisions without running them through little Papa Jamie first, a man who is just notorious for being a terrible person both inside and out. While the conservatorship was dropped in 2021, the pain of her time is still lingering. She said that the conservatorship stripped her of her womanhood and made feel like a child. In her memoir, Brittany revealed that if she had been allowed to make her own decisions instead of her father, that she would be in a much better place. She wrote that 13 years of her life went by with her feeling like a shadow of herself. She constantly thinks back to the times her father would control her body or her money and it makes her sick to her stomach. Most of her life was controlled by someone else for a very long time, but now that she's free, who knows what will happen next. Number 10, germaphobe. While speaking to Jonathan Ross in a 2015 interview, Priscilla Presley revealed that her late ex-husband was terrified of germs and would take his phobia to the extreme. She claimed that he even even refused to use anyone else's silverware, which even included the ones at high-end restaurants. She said that because of his secret germophobia, he never liked to go to other people's homes to eat because he would have to take his own silverware and that would often cause quite an uncomfortable situation, as you could imagine. Quote, and he didn't like drinking out of cups that other people had drunk out of, even restaurants or other people's homes. So when he drank, he would drink where the handle was, knowing that no one would ever drink at that side. Although this information is not widely known, Priscilla says Elvis has been that way ever since he was a child. She believed that he just didn't like to put his mouth where other people had put their mouth, especially with cutlery and dishes, which is definitely something most people wouldn't have known about the star. Number 9. Liked Younger Women In her book Elvis and Me, Priscilla Presley wrote that she just turned 14 when she met Elvis Presley, who was 24 years old at the time and already an international superstar. Despite the scandal, they started an intimate courtship that lasted seven years before they eventually married in 1967. Now, the age difference is creepy on its own, but it becomes even creepier when you compare that to what Linda Thompson wrote in her own memoir. Thompson, who dated Elvis after his marriage to Priscilla ended, was also very young and inexperienced at the time. In fact, he allegedly told her, quote, I want to preserve you for as long as you need. Whatever he meant by that, it just sounds super icky. Elvis reportedly took advantage of his power to manipulate young young, impressionable fans whenever he went on tour. Joel Williamson, who wrote a historical book about Elvis, claimed that two years before he met his future wife, the star took a group of three girls with him on tour for the purpose of, quote, pillow fights, tickling, and cuddling. Number eight, his vanity. Fame is a terrible drug that often pushes stars into the oddest methods of trying to stay thin and beautiful. Linda Thompson wrote in her memoir that Elvis's obsession with being slim would drive him to bizarre measures to keep the weight off, including an 
alleged two week period of sedation. That's exactly what it sounds like. Elvis mainly slept all day except for brief periods where he woke up long enough to go to the bathroom and eat a small portion of food before being sedated again and going back to sleep. She also claimed that he regularly did crash diets on just 500 calories a day. She also exposed his secret about why he constantly wore shirts with high collars. Apparently he did it to conceal his neck, which he actually hated. She wrote that the whole reason he wore the trademark style was to keep his quote skinny little chicken neck hidden from the public. Then at age 40, Elvis allegedly opted for a facelift. Quote, there has been speculation through the years that Elvis has his eyes done or some other mystery procedure, but that mini facelift was the extent of his plastic surgery. Well, it seems like his ex-wife was really intent on revealing a side of him that was incredibly vain. Number seven, pet chimpanzee. This one is really messed up. Billy Smith, who was a member of Elvis's entourage, openly talked about how Scatter, Elvis's pet chimpanzee, was essentially used as a party favor that they trained to harass women. It's said that the chimp would often look for women at parties and grab onto their clothes. According to Smith, Scatter also drank heavily. Quote, he could down a fifth of liquor before you knew it. Smith remembered another time when Scatter was beaten by a woman at a party for misbehaving. There have been conflicting reports about what really happened to the chimp. Some state that he merely lost his life due to old age, but Smith speculated that Scatter was poisoned by one of the maids who was tasked with feeding him after he was abandoned by Elvis and the crew who were out on the road. Although it's unclear exactly how he passed, it appears as though Scatter took his last breath on his own after years of living the party lifestyle. The whole thing was really rather sad as it seemed like Elvis and his friends used the chimp just to entertain themselves and discarded him when they went on tour. Number six, attacked his fiance. After Linda Thompson, Elvis briefly dated Mindy Miller before becoming involved with Ginger Alden, who was a full 20 years younger than him. It was only two months into their relationship when Elvis proposed to her and she accepted. The couple planned to walk down the aisle just a few months before Elvis's untimely death and Alden even said how excited he was about their wedding and their future together as a couple. She revealed to Express that during his final days, quote, Elvis was looking forward to many things, marriage, more children, serious films and his next tour. But Elvis was reportedly very manipulative when it came to women and could be extremely jealous and controlling. According to sources close to the star at the time, he could get very violent. His treatment of her was horrifying and the pair constantly argued during their time together. After one particular fight, he allegedly asked someone in his entourage to pop the tires on Alden's car so she couldn't leave his home. And on another occasion, when she was driving away after an argument, Elvis reportedly aimed his weapon at her car and fired. Number five, allegations of racism. Last year, Quincy Jones revealed to the Hollywood Reporter that he always refused to work with Elvis because he was a racist. The musician best known for producing Michael Jackson's albums, Thriller, Off the Wall, and Bad, made the comments about Elvis's supposed history of racism in his new interview. The outlet asked Jones about Presley after the producer compared Jackson to the king of rock and roll. The 88-year-old musician and producer described a time when he was writing for the orchestra leader Tommy Dorsey in the 50s and Elvis came in saying, quote, I don't want to play with him. Jones went on to call Elvis a racist and added, quote, but every time I saw Elvis, he was being coached by Otis Blackwell, telling him how to sing. And while there wasn't an overwhelming amount of accusations surrounding Elvis's past racism, there are certainly many allegations against the icon for appropriating black culture and repackaging it to the general public as his own. Despite this, it's obvious that American society still allowed him to have a very successful career, whether it was something the late singer did consciously or subconsciously. Number four, hidden children. Even though he has been gone for many, many years, Elvis Presley has always been the center of several new scandals and controversies. One of the many that have hit the headlines in the last few years is that the king of rock and roll supposedly kept hidden children from the rest of the world. The National Enquirer actually conducted a two-year investigation into the hidden children of the Presley family, reportedly acquiring witness testimonies, checking receipts, mail correspondence, birth certificates, and even DNA tests. The result of the investigation allegedly proves that Elvis did have several additional children that were being kept away from the spotlight of Hollywood. In fact, multiple alleged mothers of Elvis's hidden children have come forward to tell their stories about how they met the star. And the stories have some strange similarities. One example is Desiree Romaine Presley, who is the daughter of Lucy de Barbin, and she claims 
claims that her mother was in a 24 year long relationship with Elvis and was being kept away from the media. But the crazy thing is that Desiree's father is listed as Randolph Presley on her birth certificate, someone who allegedly worked at the Air Force Base in Oklahoma City. Number three, addicted to medication. It's not unheard of for celebrities to turn to substances as a way to cope with fame and just how crazy their lives become in the spotlight. But Elvis's alleged addictions could have had a very different origin when you look at the tragedy of his mother's passing. In 1958, he was drafted into the US Army, he went to Germany, but had to return to the US less than six months later because of his mother's untimely death. Many people believe that this marked the beginning of the end for Elvis, who quickly headed down a path of self destruction. As soon as he returned to Germany, it's reported that Elvis partied heavily and would often get into fights. During this time, he also started taking illegal substances to try and deal with the grief of losing his mother. This probably snowballed, and it's assumed that from that moment on, the misuse of substances played a major role in his life. Linda Thompson wrote several examples in her memoir about these incidents and says that she often found Elvis passed out in a bowl of chicken noodle soup under the influence of sedatives. She even says that doctors tried to hospitalize him for two weeks after misusing a combination of medication for far too long. Number two, why Priscilla ended things. Because she was only 14 years old when their courtship began, it's really no surprise that she missed out on a huge chunk of her adolescence. She told Jonathan Ross in 2015, quote, I was kind of lost, really in who I was earlier in my life. I really didn't have teenage years. After their first child, Lisa Marie was born, Priscilla accused Elvis of not wanting to sleep with her after she had given birth. Elvis told her that he wanted her to recover, but Priscilla later wrote in her memoir that he had mentioned before they were married that he had never been able to make love with a woman who'd had a child. In fact, throughout their marriage, Elvis continued to cheat on Priscilla with other women, and she herself had her own affair with an owner of a dance studio. It's safe to say that their marriage never really recovered. They finalized their divorce in 1973, and she said that this was because her life was his life, which meant her problems were always going to be secondary. Years later, she admitted that she did not divorce him because she didn't love him, but because she had to find out about the world. She was clearly just way too young when they started seeing each other. Number one, erratic violence. In recent years, Linda Thompson has been pretty open about her time with Elvis Presley, stating, quote, we all knew how dangerous Elvis's rage could be. Apparently, when she first noticed Elvis could get pretty angry was when someone reportedly stole personal photos of one of his ex-girlfriends with another woman. She claimed that he then decided to show off his samurai sword collection while under the influence of illegal substances and left her fearing for her life. Although she said that he was true to his word and he didn't in fact hurt her, she was concerned because his talents were entirely impaired due to the narcotics. These were just some of the several times that his ex said that she worried about his boiling rage. Apparently, the musician even invested in a concealed carry permit to take the weapons on stage with him, including several that were actually stuffed into his shoes, just in case someone got a little bit too rowdy in the crowd. Even singer Tom Jones spoke about Elvis's love of weapons during a visit to his dressing room. Tom said that he noticed the loaded weapon just sat on the side and simply handed it to Elvis by wrapping it in a towel. Sounds a little crazy to me. Starting off this countdown in no particular order, we've got John Hamm. John Hamm is most notably famous for his role in the hit television series Mad Men as a cutthroat advertising executive. What he may not want you to know about him, however, were his less than savory college days that landed him in some serious trouble. In 1990, John was arrested for his alleged role in a fraternity hazing that turned horribly violent. His fraternity house was even dissolved after Ham and his friends harmed a pledge so violently that he was in the hospital, even going as far as to light him on fire. John was charged with a misdemeanor offense, and when he was asked about it in 2018, his response wasn't the best. Well, I was essentially acquitted. I wasn't convicted of anything. I was caught up in a big situation, a stupid kid in a stupid situation, and it was a bummer. I moved on from it. Okay, now we're moving on, I guess. In at number nine is Richard Pryor, the iconic comedian who is often cited as direct inspiration for other comedy legends like Eddie Murphy and Dave Chappelle. Pryor changed the game. But what you may not know is that there was an extremely dark past behind the All Smiles comic. Richard grew up in an extremely unstable childhood, raised by a substance using mother in a brothel in Illinois. Richard saw things that no child should ever have to see, and to cope with such a horrifying childhood, he also turned to substance use to self-medicate. Richard was married seven times to five different women who had trouble with the comic's insatiable personal life. He even almost passed away at his own hand when he doused himself in rum and lit 
lit himself on fire while using substances. Pryor's friend even stated in an interview, quote, he has about 13 personalities, and while you could deal with nine of them, the other four are a nightmare. At number eight is Billy Tipton. Billy Tipton, if you haven't heard of him, was a revered jazz musician who rose to fame in the 1940s and 1950s. He lived his life in relative normalcy outside of his celebrity status. Although he was never married, he did have five serious girlfriends, all of whom referred to themselves as Miss Tipton. Eventually, he settled down with a woman named Kelly, and they adopted three sons together. It wasn't until his death from a stomach ulcer in 1989 that, as he was being rushed to the hospital, his giant secret was uncovered. Billy Tipton was born a woman and had concealed his sex throughout his entire life, even from his relationships. The revelation came as, quote, a shock to nearly everyone, including the women who had considered themselves his wives, as well as his sons and the musicians who traveled with him. To explain away any intimacy that would have happened between his partners, Billy reportedly said that he was in a serious car accident that mutilated his body, leaving him unable to perform. At the time this was revealed, it sent shockwaves through the music scene where trans performers were basically completely unheard of. And at number seven is Prince. The iconic pop singer is considered one of the greatest musicians to have ever lived, but he also had a secret that was only uncovered upon his tragic and sudden death in 2016. After he passed, many stories started to come to light as both bank statements became public and from various sources. These bank statements revealed that Prince had been secretly donating insane sums of money to various charities throughout his life, each with the condition that the donation be private and that the donor be kept a secret. A few organizations that he did support in the days before his death were the Harlem Children's Zone and Uptown Dance Academy New York. He even donated $12,000 to the Louisville Free Public Library in order to keep it from closing, all under the condition that they keep his name unlisted from donor records. He reportedly gave thousands away at a time, particularly to charities related to children, as his own child tragically passed away after only six days of life. He also focused on environmental issues, and uniquely, unlike a lot of celebrities who choose to invest so they get a financial return, Prince just donated to foundations that support environmental causes and a transition to solar power. Number six, Jimmy Page. Jimmy Page is the virtuoso guitarist and founder of Led Zeppelin. Jimmy is largely known as one of the greatest guitarists in the history of rock music. I mean, he set the standard for the many who have imitated his electric style. Yet, what he may not want you to know about him is his predatory relationship with a young girl who was only 14 at the time. While he toured with Led Zeppelin, Jimmy dated Lori Maddox, although they kept their relationship extremely private and basically hidden because it was, you know, illegal and creepy. Even in the loose 70s, this relationship could have put Paige in jail. They dated for a little while, and who knows what they did behind the scenes, but Jimmy eventually dumped her for B.B. Bell, who was of age at the time, thank God. Either way, not a fan of this one. In at number five is Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick is known largely for his titular role as Ferris Bueller in the John Hughes coming of age film, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He was also in The Producers and a bunch of other A-list movies. What you may not know about him, however, is that he was directly involved and in fact caused the death of numerous people. He and Jennifer Grey, the star of Dirty Dancing, were on a romantic vacation in Ireland when Matthew head on hit the car of a 28 year old woman and her mother. Both women were pronounced dead at the hospital. The road was straight and easy to navigate. The issue was that they were in Ireland and he out of habit drove on the wrong side of the road, which led to the crash. Following the accident, Broderick was convicted of careless driving but was only fined $175, which to this day, the family of the victims called a quote, travesty of justice. At number four is Jackie Chan. While Jackie Chan appeared as a comedic kung fu fighting man on the screen, his personal life is absolutely insane and surprisingly not well known. In fact, Jackie himself didn't know until well into his career just how many secrets were being kept in his family. He learned in 2003 that he had two secret brothers living in China and that his father was a nationalist spy on secret missions to bust substance crime in mainland China. In fact, that's where he met Jackie's mother. In what seems like a moment straight out of a noir crime boss movie, Jackie's father met met his mother, Li Li Chan, because he was sent to bust her as an infamous dealer and legendary gambler in Shanghai. So his mother was one of the lords of the Chinese underbelly and his father was sent to arrest her. The two fled to Australia together where they lived until their death. Jackie's father also revealed that the actor's real family name isn't Chan at all, but rather Fang. How's that for a family reunion? In at number three is Rose McGowan. Rose was one of the founding spokespersons in the Me Too movement, joining dozens of women who brought Harvey Weinstein Weinstein to justice. She is best known for her 90s movies like Jawbreaker, Scream, and Encino Man. But what you may not
not know about her is her rather horrifying upbringing. She was born in Florence, Italy, where her parents lived in a commune called the Children of God. Basically, she was born into a cult that had mass allegations of horrifying crimes against humanity. I can't really say what they are because of YouTube restrictions, but if you're curious, I suggest you look into it with a serious content warning in mind. The cult in question lured people in with promises of all kinds of physical intimacy and activities with extremely young women set to perform such acts on the men in the cult. Luckily for Rose, she was largely protected from the more heinous side of the cult and she and her family fled when she was 14 years old, where quote, we hid in an old stone house and had to boil pots of water to take baths. The cult sent people to find us. I remember a man trying to break in with a hammer. Number two on the list, Rihanna. While the celebrity singer is in the news lately for her exciting pregnancy with ASAP Rocky, what you may not know about her is her rather insane early life and the secrets that they kept even from her until they were finally brought to light. Old family photos were unearthed that reveal a secret side of the family that Rihanna herself rarely ever talks about, her father's other kids. Rihanna has three older siblings through her father by three different women as he admitted to being quite the womanizer in his heyday. Her and her father have an extremely complicated relationship as he has dealt with substance use issues for most of his life. And now to find out that she had three other siblings she knew nothing about, it's a wonder the two have stuck together through so much. And in at number one is Mark Wahlberg. The actor and singer needs no introduction, but he may need a little disclaimer beside his name for the rather horrifying incident he caused in the 80s. When he was 16 years old, Mark had an extremely harsh life and he ended up brutally harming an elderly Vietnamese man in a racially motivated attack. He shouted slurs at him while physically harming him so badly that Mark was charged with attempted murder. While he was sentenced to two years in prison, for some reason he only served 45 days. In a beautiful show of faith, his victim, whose name is Johnny Trin, stated that he forgives Mark. Quote, everyone deserves another chance. He was young and reckless, but I forgive him now. He paid for his crime when he went to prison. Mark got a pardon from the court, basically exonerating him from his crime, an action that he later stated he regrets. Quote, I didn't need that. I spent 28 years righting the wrong. I was relieved to find out that the injuries to his eye had occurred in the early 70s and not from the incident that happened that night, but I was able to meet with him and his wife and his daughter and apologize for these horrific acts. Some good can come out of it. Number 10, Miley Cyrus. Miley Cyrus has been involved in a ton of scandals over the years, varying from super serious to little tiffs. She may not have meant to, but she followed suit with her fellow Disney stars and landed in hot water time and time again. I swear, the moment you are casted in a Disney show, you have an 80% chance of being arrested. Because of her public problems and overall chaotic antics, it should be no surprise that Miley is banned from China. Shockingly, the Chinese government didn't take offense to her doing illegal substances or dancing in her birthday suit on a wrecking ball. No. They were upset with her because of a picture she took where she was imitating Asian people by pulling back the skin around her eyes. You know, one of the most offensive things on the planet? The Organization for Chinese Americans had strong words to say about the picture, but the Chinese government ramped things up to a million. They decided to straight up ban Miley Cyrus from ever entering the country. That's fair. The Chinese foreign minister got involved telling the press that Miley made it clear that she is no friend to China or anyone else of East Asian descent. Going on to say that the country had no interest in polluting the minds of the children. Miley actually clapped back and said that the media took the photo out of context. In what context is pulling your eyes back? Okay. Number nine, Brad Pitt. Fun fact if you are an actor and wish to do anything in China, just try avoiding Tibet as a workplace. The Chinese government is apparently very sensitive about the region and is neurotic about anything having to do with the Dalai Lama. Brad Pitt found this out the hard way. In, in 1997, Brad starred in the film Seven Years in Tibet, playing the 14th Dalai Lama's tutor. Chinese officials found the film to be offensive, especially because of how it portrayed the Chinese occupation of Tibet, almost as if their government thought the movie was going to be some action thriller where the Dalai Lama was a bad guy. The officials decided that the filmmakers should be punished for their work, so they barred the main cast and crew of the film from ever entering China again which included Brad Pitt. That ban was in effect until 2016, when after 19 years, the government decided that he learned his lesson. Considering how well American films do in China these days, it's kind of a no-brainer to let Brad Pitt back into the country. Number eight, Selena Gomez. For a lot of people, meeting the Dalai Lama is a privilege and just really cool experience, but for former Disney wizard Selena Gomez, it meant that she would no longer be welcome in China. While in rehearsals for Wee Day in Vancouver 2014, Selena 
Selena had the opportunity to meet the Dalai Lama. Someone snapped a pic and Selena, being who she is, decided to share that picture with her Instagram and Twitter followers. The funny thing is that the ban was not an immediate thing. It actually took a while for outrage to grow. In fact, she wasn't even aware that there were any issues until two years later when she was planning tour dates in China. Her website announced shows scheduled for Guangzhou and Shanghai one day, but one day those dates suddenly vanished. The government got around to enacting a ban on her for the two year old picture. It's funny to think that a bunch of officials in China sat around a table trying to decide what to do about Selena Gomez. They really did not have much of a reason to make a fuss out of one picture and more than likely spent a solid amount of time just scrolling through pictures of Selena being like, oh no, is this one bad too? I, I don't really know anymore guys. Number 7. Justin Bieber In 2017, it was announced that Justin would no longer be allowed to step foot into mainland China due to his bad behavior. Those are the exact words used by the government. In a statement from the ministry, it stated that the country would not allow celebrities who have engaged in bad behavior to step foot on their soil. The statement claimed that Justin Bieber was a gifted singer, but he's also a controversial young foreign singer. They hoped that Justin would mature so that he can continue to improve on his own words, actions, and truly become a singer beloved by the public. To be fair to China, Justin has not been the chillest dude on the planet. In 2014, he shared a picture of himself visiting the controversial Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo. The shrine honors fallen warriors and pays tribute to convicted criminals. In China and South Korea, the shrine is seen as a symbol of Japan not being sorry for its empire past. He caused a ton of outrage and was forced to apologize and took down the photo, but deleting something doesn't mean that everything is going to be all hunky dory. In fact, it was very hunky back. Daddy. Now that doesn't work. Number six, Harrison Ford. Guess what, y'all? Harrison is just another celebrity on this list who just had to mention Tibet on the air. Despite this man spending most of his career saving lives or time traveling, his greatest achievement yet was making the Chinese government so angry that he was blacklisted from entering the country altogether. Ford is a longtime advocate for human rights and has been outspoken about China specifically and their occupation of Tibet. Having met the Dalai Lama thanks to his wife working on the script for the film Kundan, Harrison's views were altered in 1992 and in 1995 he testified before the United States Senate Foreign Relations Committee about the need for Tibetan independence and detailed all of China's human rights violations. He really made the government mad, like so mad. Chinese officials banned him from entering the country along with his then wife Melissa Matheson. 5. Sharon Stone a name that will continue to be the source of many bans is the Dalai Lama. You'll see a pattern. In 2008, Sharon Stone was talking to the press at the Keynes Film Festival when she started making comments about a very serious Sichuan earthquake. The comments were not nice. She didn't say that we should help people. No, instead this woman was certain that the earthquake was caused by bad karma built up by the Chinese for oppressing the Dalai Lama. That's something someone actually said. The earthquake was not some little thing that did a bit of damage. It took the lives of close to 90,000 people. And there was Sharon Stone, the woman who played the bad guy in 2004's Catwoman, telling people that it was probably some form of cosmic retribution. <laughs> who would have guessed? Uh, that's insensitive. It doesn't matter what she believes, blaming a natural disaster and the loss of lives on karma is just silly. So when Australia was on fire in 2020, was that because an Australian lady called me a bad name at a bar that year? No. Maybe. Who knows? To the surprise of no one at all, the Chinese government was fuming and decided to issue a ban to the 90s starlet. Not of her as a person, but of all of her films. Anything she had starred in or would ever star in would not be shown in China, which is probably part of the reason that you don't see Sharon Stone anymore. She later apologized for the comments, but that doesn't change the fact that the movie Ants can never be enjoyed by a Chinese audience ever again. Huh, what a shame. Number 4. Richard Gere When people saw Richard in Pretty Woman, Woman, they had no idea that in a few short years this man would turn into some kind of a humanitarian hero. During the 1993 Academy Awards, Richard issued an impromptu speech about the human rights issues that China had inflicted on Tibet. Now, it was an interesting choice considering that he wasn't accepting an award. He was actually presenting an award for best art direction, but he decided to skip the preamble comments and took the time to instead spread the word about Tibet. The Academy producers were furious and vowed to ban Richard from ever attending any future award ceremonies, but he didn't stop at the Academy though. Richard continued to vouch for Tibet and his longtime friend, the Dalai Lama. 
Chinese officials took a disliking to Richard and banned him from entering the country, which had a devastating impact on his career. Since like a third of profit margins from film come from China, major studios stopped casting Richard, fearing distribution repercussions from the Chinese government. Number three, Bjork. Bjork is not just a talented musician with a fun name, but she also ventured into multiple jobs and lifestyles over the years. In 2000, she appeared in Lars von Trier's Dancer in the Dark, a film that did not cause her to be banned from China. It was actually a live show, eight years later that sealed the deal. During a 2008 Shanghai concert, Bjork ended her performance of the song Declare Independence by shouting, Tibet! Tibet! In the grand scheme of life, that doesn't really sound like a lot, right? It's not really that bad. Well, wrong. When you actually break down the lyrics of the song, it's all about countries gaining their independence, making their own flags and currency, and battling against oppression. I'm not sure if you've noticed at this point, but uh, China doesn't like it when you call them out on stuff. Needless to say, they were not thrilled to be a part of this one. The government quickly issued a statement. York and other performance artists threatened Chinese national views. Suddenly, a ton of musicians were banned from China, and Bjork was, of course, first and foremost. Most, but this was ridiculous. I mean, Bob Dylan was even. Now that one makes sense. Number two, Anastasia Lin. In 2016, beauty queen Anastasia Lin starred in a Canadian Chinese film about the human rights violations in China. This was not the first time that she was involved in Chinese human rights. For most of her adult life, Lin has been an outspoken critic of China, and the film was just the most recent example. While this was okay for a while, China decided they had had enough. Chinese officials banned Lin from entering the 65th annual Miss World pageant, which was being held in China. Lin did not give up up and planned to enter the country by requesting on-demand visa when her flight landed in China. The strategy was basically just show up anyway and hope that the government won't want to cause a scene. You know the same thing that people do when you show, you know the same thing that you do when you try sneaking into a party that you weren't invited to. The government, however, did not bend. The organizers of the next pageant told her that she could compete in 2016 under one condition. She could not mention human rights during the pageant. Lynn caved and followed through. She is still pursuing human rights though to this day. And at number one, Lisa from Blackpink. K-pop fans will surely recognize Lisa from the band Blackpink. I'm not gonna pretend for a single second that I listen to K-pop, so please bear with me. Lisa was not banned for something that she actually did, but instead of somewhere that she went with some of her fellow singers. But instead of somewhere that she went, Lisa and a few of her bandmates attended the Crazy House in Paris, a well-known burlesque show featuring some pretty risque performances. The group were bashed by government officials in China and their social media accounts were taken down as a result. They are no longer able to post on China's largest platform, Weibo, and so far it's looking like this may be the last that people see of Lisa. Maybe. Again, I'm not real. I don't know. At number 10, we have Snoop Dogg. The reason he was invited onto the show was actually because Jado wanted to have a conversation with him about his previous actions. When Kobe Bryant passed away in the accident, Gail King had a lot to say about it. She had mentioned a court case that he had been a part of decades ago, before he married his wife, and before he became famous. So Snoop Dogg, being the down to earth and honest person he is, gave Gail a piece of his mind because her comments were highly unprofessional and unnecessary as well. So Jada, in retaliation, had him on the show. And she said that when he was insulting Gail, she felt like she was being personally attacked by his comments, even though it had nothing to do with her. Jada claimed that by calling Gail names and saying she needed to watch herself, Jada thought that meant Snoop was stripping her power away from her as a woman and away from her mother and her daughter. As a woman, she felt demeaned. So even though she had nothing to do with what happened between Snoop and Gail, she had forced herself into the situation and got Snoop on her show just to tell him how she really felt. Even though it was Gail who started the feud and brought up things that didn't need to be said, Jada managed to convince Snoop Dogg he was in the wrong. At number nine, we have Sandra Bullock. She was a guest star on the show and had actually opened up about her two children, 
and her partner. She admitted that her partner didn't have to do with the adoption of her daughter, but is still very supportive of all of them. She talked about how she tries to keep her children out of the spotlight because she doesn't want to scar them for the rest of their lives, considering her son was already uncomfortable with the thought of fame. Something she mentioned was that she wished her and her adopted daughter's skin was the same shade as hers because it would make them look more approachable. Considering the podcast is hosted by mothers and daughters, it makes sense to open up about that kind of thing about them. But the way she phrased that comment raised some eyebrows. At number eight, we have Tiffany Haddish. She has received backlash from many different things. From getting snippy with interviewers to continuously trying to take photos with Shakira. So when she was on Red Table Talks, it got real and they got into the discussion of hair. Since Tiffany Haddish has begun shaving her head as well. She claimed that she had really started to fall in love with herself again because she could properly see her features. And to boost her own ego, she said that God did a good job putting her together. She had self-confidence issues because the past few guys she had been with all had opinions on her hair. So a man can't have an opinion on your hair if you don't have any. It's good that they can all come together over that, but they are bald for very different reasons. And at least Tiffany can take a joke about her hair, unlike Jada. At number seven, we have Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart is a very honest person. He's very blunt, but he is also very funny. So to have him on the podcast sounded like a recipe for disaster. Well, believe it or not, it was Will who hosted the episode because he and Kevin had one thing in common, an internal affair affecting their lives. It was funny because Kevin actually showed up an hour late to the show, no doubt because of lack of interest in the topic, or scared that he too would make a joke and get smacked for it. Well, they both got along and it actually went pretty well, from them talking about having an affair and how it's affected the kids, and how things he said years ago are resurfacing and taking a toll on his personal life. They also talked about how it's important to be real with your kids first, because it's going to end up on the internet somehow. Then everyone will know, including them. That seemed to be the downfall for both of them. At number six, we have Paris Jackson. She is actually one of Willow's friends who agreed to be on the show. They share some things in common, like both being daughters of famous musical artists or actors, and Paris being Michael Jackson's daughter and all. They also share a common list of mental illnesses, struggling to find who they are because they were forced to live in their parents' shadow, their relationship preference, you know, just girly things. The entire episode was them talking about how awful it was to have famous parents. Paris talked about how she has severe paranoia because she hears paparazzi clicks when there's no one there, and how it caused severe depression. The entire thing gets into their first world problems and how mentally damaging it was. We know they're both Nepo babies, which is why they get along so well. They both find they struggle with mental illnesses brought upon them by their parents, considering Paris is the ungrateful daughter of the incredible Michael Jackson. No one can control what you're born into, but with lavish lifestyles like theirs, neither of them are really in a place to complain about anything. Unless it's of course how terrible it is to have famous parents. At number five, we have Matthew McConaughey. Jada set up a Zoom meeting between him and one of his coworkers from 35 years ago. In his memoir, Green Lights, he had talked about a woman he worked with named Tammy, who he claimed opened his eyes to new cultures. He described her as black and beautiful as midnight and a rock star waitress who had men, including him, thinking they really had a chance when she only did it so they'd tip more. Jada tracked her down and invited her to the Zoom meeting. And he was actually pretty ecstatic. It was a very sweet gesture and they actually both seemed to have a great time with it. At number four, we have Demi Moore. Jada invited her onto the talk show with her daughters to talk about generational trauma, which is a very hefty topic, especially coming from a parent who was sleeping with her son's friend. Demi got into how her mother's mental and physical impact was objectively passed down to her daughters because it's what she's known and what she grew up with. Jada admitted they are in the process of healing from generational trauma as well. So she called out her own mother on the podcast, which in any normal circumstance, probably wouldn't go very well. The entire situation was about being transparent about motherhood and knowing you traumatized your own children because of your fame and poor choices. To add to the point about Demi Moore and her mother's struggle with substances, Jada said that she too suffered from generational trauma because her mother was similar when she was younger by forcing her to get married to Will Smith when she didn't want to. The fact that she was willing to talk about generational trauma in front of her mother, whom she hosts the show with, 
was really shocking. Considering her mother forcing her to marry Will was probably the best choice she could have made because now she has her whole life set up for her, even if Jada wants to run around with other people. You can't blame a mother for wanting what's truly best for her daughter, even if it makes her unhappy. At number three, we have Keanu Reeves. Somehow they managed to have 100 episodes, and for the 100th, they had Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss on the show. Well, in the interview, he's barely mentioned. He's just there to be there, because it was like a mini cast reunion. In the reviews of the episode, it's all about Carrie Ann Moss and Priyanka Chopra, but Keanu isn't even mentioned once in the summary of the episode. It seems like he was invited as filler, just so Jada can get the views she's desperate for. At number two, we have Gwyneth Paltrow. It was the interview with Gwyneth Paltrow that got her in hot water to begin with. Gwyneth didn't call her out, but she became a safe space for her to open up, which made her look even more like the bad guy. They were opening up about their relationship issues, and that was when Jada said that she wanted Will to read her mind to know what she liked, rather than communicating her feelings like an adult. She claimed that she expects her partner to know what she likes, even if she never verbally shared how she felt, then finished off that little segment by saying she just somehow wasn't satisfied with him. Gwyneth got into what life was like with her husband and what it was like being an almond mom. One way or another, we all feel bad for their kids. And last but not least at number one, we have Facebook. This one is kind of a stretch because the situation is still unfolding. Apparently, Facebook has canceled Red Table Talks on Facebook original videos because they're gonna shut it down altogether. They're following the path that Google made by focusing more on user-generated content instead of celebrity-related content because there are many other platforms for that. They have bigger and better plans for Facebook instead of Red Table Talks. So Jada claimed the channel is still looking for a new home. Overall, it may be best for the show to be put on hold until they find a new platform for it.